Good evening, folks. Obviously, thank you all for coming tonight. What a fantastic crowd to hear John's presentation. About nine years ago, I can remember distinctly driving to work, and at that point I was at Concordia District in the Science Department. And I heard a story on the radio about what researchers believed to be structures at the bottom of Lake Huron, possibly created by indigenous peoples who lived here thousands of years ago. I can also remember how excited I was, and Carrie Wilson, McClarity can attend to this, how excited I was to relay this information that I'd heard on the radio to my science teaching colleagues. And this is the guy who found it, Dr. John O'Shea. We're very pleased to have you with us tonight, John. On behalf of the Bruce County Historical Society and the folks gathered here, I would like to welcome Dr. John O'Shea to Point Clark, Ontario, Canada. In our estimation, this is the closest gathering place to the beginning of the Amberley to Alpena Ridge that we could think of. John has delivered a similar talk to us virtually at our annual general meeting in October of 2021, but we wanted to host him in Ontario and give him a tour of Bruce County. Thanks to Robin Hillborn and Heather for hosting John and Sue, that's uh, John's wife and Sue, on their visit to our area. Dr. O'Shea is the curator of Great Lakes Archaeology in the Museum of Anthropological Archaeology at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. We were talking about what a mouthful that was before. <laughs> John specializes in prehistory, prehistoric archaeology, gaining diplomas from both Oxford University and a PhD from Cambridge University. John has conducted research underwater around the world, and he is going to share some anecdotes about his lifelong career in academic research, as well as his findings from 120 feet below the surface in Lake Huron. Besides this large body of work, John also works as a body double and stand-in for the Hollywood actor Sam Elliott. <laughs> Maybe Dr. O'Shea will tell us some about those experiences as well. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. John O'Shea. Thank you, Dan. I thought, uh, thank you, Dan. I thought coming all the way over here to Ontario, I might escape this and uh, like it, uh, <laughs> apparently not. And uh, I'd also like to say that you both stole my joke about calling it the Amberly Alpina Ridge, which is going to be my opening joke. Uh, but thanks a lot for having me here and for coming out. You know, being a Friday night, the end of summer, I thought you were being kind of over optimistic with the first two rows of uh, seats up here. <laughs> but, but the thing that, that I found it important, and this resonates with what Dan was just saying, is all around Lake Huron, uh, people that, that, that live by the lake, that have cabins by the lake, that fish on the lake, are the ones that seem to have a particular attachment and a particular interest to what we're doing. And they seem to be the ones that are, that are really the most awestruck when we describe what the world looked like here 10,000 years ago, and how different this lake that's so familiar to you all looked once upon a time in the past. And it's, it's not a completely you know, irrelevant kind of reference to our future condition either where rising sea levels and changes in climate and temperature are affecting modern, our modern society the way it did ultimately uh, in, in Lake Huron on the uh, Andalusia Alpina Ridge. Uh, so what I'd like to do today, since, I, since I've given a talk, I, I assume some of you have already heard some of this, some of you will have seen some of these slides. So what I'd like to do today is, and I've been talking about my life history like I did last time, but rather I'm gonna first, I'm going to first um, tell you a little bit of background about what we found under Lake Huron and the rationale why it works the way it does. And then I'm going to switch over and talk about some of our most recent work, most recent discoveries, including some stuff that we did literally a few weeks ago that, again, is going to kind of change how we think about this whole system. So with that as an introduction, let me start let me start by giving you a short history of the Great Lakes. As you may know, the, um, the uh, beds of the Great Lakes were formed by glacial ice. They were scoured out of, out of the bedrock. And then as the ice gradually withdrew, the meltwater began to fill in these basins. But that filling in of the basins was only half of the story. 
This mile thick body of ice is tremendously heavy and it actually suppressed the Earth's crust. So as the ice withdraws, the land surface actually rebounds. So there are two processes going on here rather than just one. The lakes are filling up with this very, very cold glacial meltwater. At the same time, the land is rising, and it's not rising in a uniform manner. And as a result of this, we get a series of different lakes uh, immediately after the, after the ice withdraws. You get what's known as Lake Algonquin, which are the original lakes, which are more than 100 meters higher than they are today. Uh, and this is when the earliest humans that we know of are generally accepted are in the Great Lakes region, these, these big game hunters with the fluted points. But following Lake Algonquin, we have a period of very low water. This is known as Lake Stanley in the Huron Basin. Uh, it's Lake Chippewa in the Michigan Basin. It's Lake Ho in the Georgian Bay, because at this point, the basin actually had three distinct lakes. You have, as we'll show you in a second, a very deep lake, a second lake, and then Georgian Bay is its own lake at this point. It's completely isolated. And this is sort of a, 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 a diagram that's kind of showing, it's kind of washed out, but kind of showing you how the lake gradually rises from about 11,500 uh, up to about 8,000. Uh, these little, these things are things geologists talk about that are probably not real, but they're, it's their chart. <laughs> uh, so here, this kind of gives you an idea of, of that time when we actually have the Alpena Amberley Ridge. And again, you see you've got these discrete lakes in the Huron Basin. The ice front is not that far away. And this is when we start getting this special corridor that forms here. Uh, here's, a, here's a more dramatic drawing of this. It was actually done by a Canadian artist. Um, and again, you can kind of see that what you have is you have these three lakes, and then you have this unique corridor that's running across here from, from where we are today, up around, up north of Alpena, actually up by Presquia. Um, you can also see that a lot of the other land surface around here, like almost the entirety of Saginaw Bay, for example, is dry land during this time. So here's what it would have looked like. Um, if you were standing sort of up here, I call this the Canadian eye view because you're north looking south to help you orient. This is where, this is Thunder Bay, this is where Alpena is, that's Saginaw Bay, there's Lake St. Clair down there. Here we are. And the thing that's striking about this is there are over 260 square kilometers of seabed that's now available for human occupation and for animal colonization. And this is a dramatic change over that previous phase when much of this would have been inaccessible. So this is, the, this is sort of our problem. Now, I'd like to draw your attention to one fact here. Okay, here is the Alpena Amberley Ridge. Uh, the international boundary is right about here. There's been no systematic work at all on this half of the Alpena Amberley Ridge. So if you want to call it the Amberley Alpena Ridge, you need to get somebody out there. <laughs> because there's some tremendously interesting landforms out here that almost certainly would have the same kinds of resort sites that, we, that we've been able to document today. So what we're doing, our research approach, and this is sort of general for underwater archaeology overall, is you first have to, have to understand the, that environment. You can't go out and just look for sites underwater. You have to know what the environment was and then model it in terms of how hunter-gatherers would have exploited it, how the animal populations would have behaved at it. And then you can begin to make predictions about where you should, where you should look. Um, we've been doing... Yeah. Yeah, this is really uncomfortable. <laughs> Maybe I could just talk louder. Um, anyway, anyway, yeah, so you know, this involves bathymetric mapping, sampling, uh, something that we've just started doing now is, is to recover ancient DNA uh, reflecting the environment under the lake at the time that the uh, lake was dry land. Um, this is actually really important for us because this is the first time we're going to know what animals were actually out there. Because like, unlike plant remains and pollen, which preserve very well, the acidic environments of these northern forest soils basically destroy all the animal bone. So, Archaeologists don't know what the fauna was like up here. The DNA will let, let us see that. Um, we're also then using uh, different kinds of remote operated vehicles and divers to actually look at things underwater, and then we're doing this computer modeling to, to fill in the gaps. So if we're going to start our story, we have to start at the late Pleistocene 
And we have to start with this fascinating animal, the caribou. Um, caribou really are fascinating animals. Um, they, um, uh, they, and, and they, they were uniquely adapted to this late Pleistocene, late, late Ice Age environment that we had in this part of the world. And what we found, or what we've beginning to understand, is that during this stage, at the end of the Ice Age, as the ice is withdrawing, the Alpena Amberley Ridge stayed very, very cold. And if you think about it, it makes sense. You've got this tremendously cold glacial meltwater surrounding it on both sides. So even as on the mainland of Ontario or Michigan, the climate is warming, that doesn't happen on the Alpena Amberley Ridge. And one of the important aspects of that is it basically creates a refugium. It created a place that these Ice Age animal species that are cold adapted were particularly attracted to. And similarly, the hunters who were adapted to hunting these guys were, were well suited to this. And so that's why we think we get some persistence of these late Ice Age looking adaptations after they begin to disappear on the mainland. Um, here's one point that helps illustrate this. These bars are showing you the number of dated paleontological caribou specimens in Michigan. Now I stress paleontological, these aren't from archaeological sites. These are the bones that turn up in bogs and that farmers bring into the paleontologists. And you notice an interesting factor. During both of the high water stages, Lake Algonquin and Lake Nipissing, there are a bunch of these fossils. During Lake Stanley, there are none. And that leads to the question, well, where are the caribou? The caribou are out under the lake. Now, the second fascinating thing about caribou is that they follow lines. It's in their little cerebrate brains that, that they follow lines. And those of you that are old enough, and by the look of the audience, probably many of you are, <laughs> will remember the first Alaska pipeline that they put. Uh, to bring oil down. And one of the unintended consequences of this is they changed the migration patterns of literally hundreds of thousands of caribou. So now when you see these pipelines, not only are they raised up off the ground, if you look at it in Google Earth, they go in zigzags, they have things built over the top of them, anything to break up the linearity. Uh, there was a study that the National Park Service in the U.S. did on the Western Arctic herd uh, relating to a new road that was built. Simple blacktop road that went east-west from Ambler Mine to the coast. And when they plotted the path of the caribou that had collars on, the caribou came to that road and then detoured 200 miles east, crossed the road, detoured 200 miles back, and continued their migration. This is simply a simple blacktop road. Now, what's important about this is even if you don't have a structure, caribou still tend to follow lines. This is them migrating across basically completely frozen barren ground, and you still see they still fo uh, follow this kind of path. This is one of the reasons why traditional hunters will tell you, don't shoot the lead animal, like at a river crossing. Let those lead animals get across, and then nail everybody else. If, but if you kill the leaders, the herd will, will sh won't cross the river there, they'll move. And this is something that the traditional hunters told us is very clearly, and it's actually formal policy now in Alaska. Anyway, why do we care about this? This is why we care about this. It's because hunter-gatherers also know these behavioral quirks of caribou, and they use them as a means for mass capture. So this is actually a, a, a pipe that's from the native village of Katsubu that was carved the turn of the 20th century. And it depicts a caribou drive into a, a, an enclosure. Um, these kinds of drives, whether you're talking about caribou or reindeer, are known throughout the northern hemisphere. They're known in Siberia, they're known in Finland, they're known in Sweden, they're known in Greenland. And they're a very, they're a very efficient way for hunters to, to attack these animals. And, uh, and so that's something that, that's in the back of our mind in terms of how the adaptation would have worked out under Lake Huron. Now the other thing that's kind of interesting about this is that the optimal conditions of the animals are in the fall. This is when their fur is in the best condition, uh, the sinews are, are the best, the hunters will tell you this is absolutely, the meat tastes best, this is the best time to get it. 
So again, there's some seasonal elements to these migrations, and these migrations happen twice a year. And very, very large numbers of animals move when this happens. So what ancient hunters tended to do was to use the knowledge to, they would create lines, and this would then get the animals into predetermined kill zones where they could then, they could then kill them. Now the thing is, you've probably heard out west of bison jumps where you, you stampede, panic, bison over a cliff kind of deal. That isn't how these drives work. The line is more like a gentle suggestion. You know, go this way. And, um, but, it, but it serves the same function. And in fact, there's a lot of research that suggests that prior to firearms, um, that, that we weren't even dealing with panicked animals. That the animals, the animals weren't panicked until they were getting killed. There wasn't a panic that leads to it. They weren't driven into everything. Now you may have some things like that. So anyway, this is a, this is a famous uh, one of these up on Baffin Island. Uh, you can see the scale of this. It's a very long one. There's a big Anukshuk right in the center. Uh, caribou also like Anukshuk. Uh, like antelope, they're very curious. And so in Siberia, the hunters will sometimes attach ribbons that will flutter in the wind. And this attracts the animals, just like it would an antelope. Uh, so we've got one of those right here at the very tall part. Here's another one that's much more of a V kind of thing. But this is, this is a big one, and you can see this is a very large structure. It's oriented on the glacier. Here's what it looks like on the ground. You remember that David Letterman routine, is this something? Uh, would you necessarily think this was anything? Uh, but this is a hunter. You can see the fireplace here. This is, what a, this is what a hunting blind looks like. That's all the concealment you need. Uh, and again, this is, this is also useful because this is a very typical glacial landscape. You see how flattened it is? Um, but this is, this is a drive line. And I've talked to hunters, and they said, you know, when the animals are migrating, if you go down on one knee, they will literally brush against you as they go by. If you stand up, they'll make a little bit of a detour. Uh, and it's particularly during these migrations, it's a very single-minded kind of, kind of process. So this is, what, this is what we're looking for. So how do we find them? So this is the, uh, again, the Amberley Alpina Ridge, you can see here. Uh, we started out by looking at three, three blocks, and each of these blocks represented a different kind of terrain that we thought might be suitable for, for people hunting caribou. And surprisingly, maybe, we found all of these same kinds of structures that we know ethnographically from caribou hunting in northern latitudes in Canada and, and Alaska. So for example, here's that drive lane I showed you before that looked more like a V. Here's the equivalent one under Lake Huron. This is a, this is a side scan sonar image. Uh, sometimes you don't even have to have continuous lines. You just have little lines of stacked stones. Uh, this is one up on the Kazan River that Andrew Stewart documented. And he was up there working with native informants who'd actually used these. That's all, that's all it took. A line of these at a river crossing, that was enough to channel the animals into your predetermined location. Here's a very similar looking one under Lake Huron. Now you might ask why we didn't Photoshop that cable out of the picture. <laughs> right? It kind of mucks it up. Well, it's sort of truth in advertising. In fact, there were a series of these, and we at first thought our cable was snagged, and we pulled one of them, one of them over, retrieving our cable. <laughs> And so this is sort of that humble, you know, be humble kind of slide that, that you have to have. Um, this is one of the most common things we find. It's called a V-shaped blind. It's basically formed by, by five boulders in a, in a V-shape. They're about, a, each of these is about a meter in diameter. Uh, this is one of the topographic settings where we find a series of them lined up. You have rock lines like this that are going to kind of channel the animals this way, and then they're up on a rise to, to ambush them. Uh, these, are, these, these blinds are really useful because not only are they cultural, but they only work if the animals are moving in one direction, right? That's giving us a clue about the season of use. We know that the migrations are happening in the spring and they're happening in the autumn. The direction of these hunting blinds tells us which season they're actually hunting the animals. 
and we found seasonal correlations between the kind of hunting they're doing, the size of the group, whether the meat is being stored or not, that coincides with the season of migration that they're actually using. And again, this is something, seasonality is something that's a real problem in the Northeast North America because again, the bones don't survive. So you need some other way of telling what, when it was that the animals were actually being attacked. We also have more complex structures. This one is, is one of the first ones we found. It's called a funnel. Um, this, is a, this is an interesting kind of sonar. It's a 360 scan, so it's scanning horizontally. And you can, what you see here is you have sort of a series of rocks that go off this way and this way. Um, this is kind of what it looks like on the ground. Here's a slightly better picture that's from a photo, photo, some photogrammetry we did. And again, you can see you've got, you've got these, this core V here. And then you have the rocks spaced off out into infinity. Uh, you have another hunting blind here. And then you have a very interesting stone here. This is a large stone. And it was originally standing upright. And you can tell because you can see the divot where it initially stood. And some, some fisherman's net pulled this thing over. Um, but it's a very interesting, and it's, there's much more going on with this. This is a much larger scale thing, and it clearly would have taken more people to run it. So what I'm going to try to show you now is what it looks like on the bottom. Excuse me. The first thing you know is it's pretty good visibility. And here you're now looking at the central part of the V. Those, each of those meter sticks are two meters long for scale. The other thing you notice is there's not much else out here. This, this is on bedrock. This is on limestone bedrock. Um, and there's a cliff fall off here, which is probably where they gathered the rocks and brought them back up here to make this structure. In the distance here, you're going to see our ROV, Jake. Uh, Jake has a Facebook page if you want to be friends. Um, and now you can see how these other stones kind of go off into the distance. Uh, here's that second hunting blind. There's the stone that was once standing upright. But what's striking about this to me is there isn't anything else out here. And so you can imagine potentially um, individual hunters behind some of these stones, behind these, the, the V parts here. Uh, that may have made just enough of a noise or a fuss to keep the animals into the, into the main area that you want them to, to go. Okay, enough of that. Here's another one of the ones that we call a complex one. This one is, is called Drop 45. And what, what it is, this is again that scanning sonar, so you can kind of see the, the basic shape of everything here on the sonar. But this is a map that's in some ways easier to see. So this is, a, this is a cobble bed that's raised up. The animals kind of come into this thing, which is cleared of rocks. There's a rock line here, and then they end up in this natural cul-de-sac. Uh, interestingly, back over here, it's also marshy. So even if they swung around this way, they'd be, they'd be kind of out of luck. Uh, these X's are locations where artifacts are recovered, uh, which would have reflected the act of processing the animals once they've been killed. And there were also two small uh, rings of rock, which looked very much like teepee rings. Basically, the rocks that would hold down is the ends of your tent. You don't, you don't use stakes when you're on bedrock. And one of these, this one actually had a central fireplace in it. So that suggests that, the, that you know, once they killed the animals, they probably killed a lot, and then they hung out here a while while they were doing the processing. Uh, we found some other things. This is, uh, sorry. this is a house structure. 
This is a slightly more complex one than the teepee ring. This is one that Andrew Stewart again recorded up on the Kazan River that his informants had told him about. Here's an almost identical set of structures, uh, actually quite close to Drop 45. Uh, we also find caches. I'll talk about this one again. This is the dragon cache. And we find temporary campsites. This is a place where it looks like they built a fire with a kind of big reflecting stone behind it. Uh, this problem wasn't covered, but it was nonetheless a kind of, kind of making use of what's immediately available uh, to make life a little more easy. So that's kind of the background of what we've been doing. So we went out there and we thought, okay, there's good reason to believe we ought to find these structures. We know kind of what these structures ought to look like ethnographically. And in fact, that's what we found. So that's great. Now, the summer, and the last couple of summers, there have been some new research. This is, uh, there's a belief over in northern Michigan that when the Air Force went to shoot down that balloon <laughs> over Lake Huron, remember that balloon? Yeah. That it was really an alien spacecraft. <laughs> And I was actually interviewed on public radio about the alien spacecraft and how come the Air Force couldn't find it. And this is a legitimate pure Michigan advert sign, but they also have our hunting structure on it. So one of the first things that's sort of new over the last couple of years is we've really extended the area that we have good bathymetric coverage. Uh, this, our original survey areas were squares about this size. These are then multi-beam surveys, which are giving us much more detailed views of the bottom. And we've now connected all of this area together, so we've got that, so clearly we've got to do that. But, so this is giving us a lot bigger area. And what's really important about having this original acoustic survey is that it lets us tell a lot about the environment. There's a byproduct, literally, of multi-beam survey, which is called backscatter. And backscatter is basically telling you what kind of acoustic target you're hitting with your sonar. Um, and so things that are hard and rock are very bright reflectors. Things that are mucky or sandy uh, reflect sound much less well. And because of this, we can basically tell you where there was standing water and where there were swamps under the lake 10,000 years ago. And that lets us begin to do modeling like this where we can actually start annotating some of the environment that would have affected how the animals moved and how the hunters moved. Uh, you put that together, you start getting these, these optimal paths for migration for the animals. You'll kind of notice that there are two places that you just have to go. Um, there are major hunting structures, as I'll show you, at both these places. Again, Canadian waters start right there. Uh, this slide doesn't show it as well as I'd like, but what this has is those same, those same migratory routes, but the red triangles are where there are known major kill, kill structures. The drop 45 one I described is right there. The blue triangles are where there are campsites or caches. And again, for the area that we've already worked, they match really well with these migration routes. What we've been working on the last two years, including this summer, is trying to fill in the gaps in this central area. Now. One of the surprising things we found in that central area is uh, preserved peat. Now peat is a soft coal. Those of you with Irish ancestry, probably your ancestors grew up burning coal in your fireplace or burning peat in your fireplace. But it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful material for analysis for us because it's basically compressed plant material that was collected in the bottom of swamps that has then, has then been compressed and is intact. So this is, this is it. When we originally found this one, uh, we noticed that there was this cut, and we assumed it was a limestone strata that water had cut through. But then there was this tree sitting there, and we couldn't figure out how a tree could be under, underneath Permian limestone. Well, when the diver went out there, uh, this whole thing lifted up, and it was peat. Uh, in this area, the peat is about 30 centimeters thick. Uh, when you go back a few, few feet, it gets a meter or more thick. And we recorded one place this summer where it's five meters thick. And this is stratified. Now, for your information, the age of this tree is about the same as the bottom of this peat. And it's 9,500 years ago. And this log here, this timber, the bottom was actually sharpened 
to stick it into wherever it was. So this is actually an artifact. And we've dated both the top and the bottom of the peat as well as this. This peat that we're seeing right here formed over a period of about 300 years. Uh, this is another, this is what it looks like when you chop it out of the edge. It comes out almost like a brick. You can see it has internal stratification. This is telling us about different depositional characteristics during that 300 year period. And we're very excited to get the deeper, thicker ones. Now what's interesting about this particular peak deposit, it's in that middle area, and it's up here, and it's, it's, in, it's in a very high elevation here. So it's, it doesn't make a lot of sense to us why you would have this upland little pond or marsh that's, that's actually very high. But this is the first set of samples that we've submitted for doing ancient DNA on the environment. And we're reckoning that we ought to get we ought to get some really good results out of it. We've got preliminarily, we've got artiodactyls, which are basically hoofed animals, and we have salmonids, which are probably lake trout or or our peat trout. Uh, another thing we've started to do is to start working in these in what we call micro regions, and that is rather than trying to look at whole huge areas underwater. Focus in on these smaller rectangles, or maybe a, maybe a kilometer by half a kilometer, and look at them in real detail. And we've used autonomous underwater vehicles to map these with sonar. Now, the advantage of doing that is the AUV can fly very close to the bottom, so we get very good resolution. So, for example, I showed you this slide earlier that has that. This is from conventional toad sonar, and this is what it looks like when you make out individual rocks with the AUV. Now, an interesting result of this is that we've discovered that many of the isolated little hunting structures we found are not, in fact, isolated little hunting structures, but they're rather parts of much larger, more complex features. So this one is, this was, again, this is, I showed you a slide of this before. This is, this is one of the original V structures that we found. I think we found this in 2011. Um, in 2013, we found another one, which is up here, which is the same shape, but it points in the other direction. This is the V cluster, there's the V blind. And it turns out they're all part of a much larger organized hunting structure, where you have another drive lane, you have a cul-de-sac, you've then got blinds kind of bracketing, bracketing the area. And what's particularly interesting here is right about here, we recovered two pieces of obsidian, which I'll tell you about in a minute. Uh, here's drop 45, again, the main drive feature that we knew about, but there's this halo of hunting blinds around it. And we reckon what's going on is this is where maybe even women and children are sitting out there, just enough to make noise to keep the animals into the central por portion of the, of the kill structure. Another thing we've started doing, and the significance of this will come hopefully soon, is we've started moving into deeper water. We're still on the AAR, but we're in the area that, that would have been earlier in time. And we started finding features like this. This is a rock face that's about three to four meters tall. And what this looks to be is a wave cut notch. Um, this, is, this is now at 150, 165 feet. Um, so we're, we've moved a good 30, 40 meters or feet deeper. And the interesting thing about these is that they, they might have been inhabited. And so one of the challenges is how are we going to work at these deeper depths and how are we going to collect samples to look for cultural material? Finally, we started doing this simulation. When we started this work, we knew that we needed some way to help predict where the animals were going to be. We needed some way to know where we should look. And so we developed with Bob Reynolds and his students at Wayne State basically an artificial intelligence model of caribou migrating across this environment. And it was really fascinating to watch because you know, we first reconstructed the environment and then you launch a thousand little caribou automata. And through thousands of iterations, they discover the most optimal way of moving through the landform. And we use this for site prediction. Where should we find sites? Remember I showed you that map that had the two places you had to go? We first learned that from the simulation. But the simulation has grown to tell us other things. One of the really interesting things it's told us is it's let us start to make estimates of how large the number of animals 
um, actually was. And this is, this is a matter of, of huge debate, not just for archaeologists, but for wildlife managers. Uh, we know for a fact that in the historic era, the numbers of caribou were, were decimated globally, um, particularly when the introduction of firearms, later the introduction of snow machines. And there's a lot of question about how many animals were there before you had these technological innovations. Um, so one of, Bob, sorry, one of Bob Reynolds' students, Serge um, Saad, actually did some simulations where they looked at survivorship and the size of the herd. And she did it under different kinds of conditions. So it's like not just how many animals, but are they going in, in multiple waves? Are they going in a single wave? How are they doing it? And what comes out of this simulation that's really striking is if you take like an 80% survival rate, you may, have, you may well have 100,000 or more animals that could potentially have migrated just across the Alpena Amberley Ridge. Now currently, the number of the animals in the Western Arctic caribou herd, which is the entire western part of Alaska, is 250,000 caribou. So we literally could have had half of that herd just walking between Amberley and Alpena. It's quite an eye opener. Now another thing we did was we took this virtual world and we took it up to traditional caribou hunters and said, does this look right, first of all? And secondly, we asked them to explain to us why our sites are where they are. So these old guys, and there was a lot of concern whether they'd be able to manage the headphone, headset, and everything. Well, they took to it like ducks to water. And they were able to tell us why the sites were where they are. They were able to tell us what was wrong with our model. Uh, it was a very interesting process. Indeed, one of, the, one of the really cool things that came out of this was we were giving a presentation on our stuff in Lake Huron up in the village of Kotzebue, which is north of the Arctic Circle. And the first question I got was a hunter who said, you know, I have structures just like that on my hunting ground, and I never knew what they were for. And the reason he didn't know what they were for is because you had to have a lot more animals for those to work than they have now. But it was also really cool that they were, they were so interested in the thing that they were quite interested to see something that they didn't recognize before. Um, but the other thing that came through when we talked to elders, and it was actually this guy who's sitting there on the left, is he asked us, could we allow him to take people with him when he went to the virtual world? And we said, well, why would you want to do that? And he said, well, I'd like to take my grandson hunting and show him about caribou, but I can't get him away from the video games. <laughs> and here is a video game. So in fact, uh, building on that insight, we created a virtual world that multiple students could enter at the same time and collaborate with. Uh, our first trial with this was at Alpena High School, and we've done this for two years now, where the students actually have the virtual world, they have the headsets, and then they make predictions as to where the site should be. What we hope to do in future is to link this classroom with the classroom in Kotzebue and have kids that actually grew up hunting caribou doing collaborating with the kids that know Lake Huron. Now just to give you um, a, a flavor of how this works, this, this is really um, drank kind of dull, but uh, the students are allowed to make five optimal picks. So I do it here on the chart of Lake Huron so you can see how absurd this whole idea is, that you can just pick a pot, spot in the middle of the lake and find a site. Uh, but the, the, their picks are also here then on the bottom bathymetry. Uh, one, three, four, and five didn't work, but number two turned out to be very interesting. Number two turned out to not only have a stone alignment, but to have another deposit of peak that we hadn't found before. And this is a preserved stump of a cedar. And literally, an hour ago, I got the date on the peak and the cedar, and it's 9,100 years ago. I mean, and that was the student's pick, too. Sign up. Um, 
We've also done some excavation. We've begun to recover material. Uh, some of this is old, some of this is new. This is a neat little thumbnail scraper. See, it's not very big. What's unique about it is it's made on Bayport Chirp. And Bayport Chirp comes from down in Charity Island. So that's at least 100 kilometers south of where it was found on Drop 45. So that's telling us somebody moved it there. The glaciers didn't take it there. People carried it up there. This is the obsidian I mentioned to you before. There are two flakes. Uh, the obsidian has been definitively sourced to the wagon tire source in central Oregon. 3,000 kilometers away. 9,000 years ago. And what's neat about this is that these flakes were part of resharpening a tool and they occurred in the middle of a kill site. So we're not dealing with some magic material here. We're dealing with a utilitarian item that was being used and resharpened while they were crossing the caribou at, at the South Gap site. This is the earliest Western obsidian ever found this far east. It's the first occurrence of wagon tire this side of the Mississippi River. And it happened 9,000 years ago. This is uh, that cache site I was telling you about, the Dragon Cache. Uh, this is Wayne Lasardi, the Michigan State Underwater Archaeologist. And you see he's brushing off. They're not really white. The white is dead algae. Uh, those of you who dive in the Great Lakes know that because the zebra mussels and the quagga mussels cleared the water column, you get algae much deeper in the water. And then it dies, and it looks white like this. But when you scrape it off, these boulders are all red. It's old red sandstone off the Canadian Shield. Now, nobody carried that down there. The ice carried it down there. But they intentionally grouped these rocks together, and I'm sure that the color was part of the deal. Uh, there was a servant tooth fragment inside, inside this cache, and there were three other really unique kinds of artifacts. This is actually a grooved axe. This edge is sharpened. Here's the groove here. Uh, this is a net sinker. You see the notches, the opposite notches. And this is a chopper. This chopper is of the kind of quartzite that comes from Manitoulin Island. Now, some of that was transported by glaciers. But nonetheless, these two, both of these tools aren't supposed to happen until the late archaic. They're 5,000 years too early. But they're here, and they were being stored here. So these hunters were not just hunting caribou, but they were planning ahead. They, were, they didn't want to carry this stuff around. They left it where they were going to use it next time. And this is, this is a very predictable, this suggests a very mature adaptation to this environment. They knew where they were going to be each season. They were going to come back. Uh, we also found these really fascinating micro tools. Notice the scale on these tools. These are very finely made, but they're very, very small. Most of them were made on glacial cobbles, and they're made by, by bipolar reduction. Uh, nothing like this has been reported for this time period anywhere in the Great Lakes. But it's common on these sites under Lake Huron. Uh, here's an example where they were using, this is one of a series of blades that were actually mounted together in a bone half to make a composite tool. And even on this very small, that says two millimeters there, you've got retouch here to make it fit, you've got damage to the edge, and you've got wear that reflects it wobbling in the, in the haft. You can see the microscopic striations on the stone. So again, this is, this is the kind of technology that, that we're very familiar with in the Arctic, not known in the Great Lakes. So, the obvious question is, where are all these big bifaces that we find right here in Ontario or up in, uh, up in Michigan? Uh, either the Clovis, which are gaining points with the flutes, or, or the high low, these, these late Paleo-Indians. We have found zero. We found a few flakes that may come from large bifaces. We have not found a single one of these. And that raises the question of, well, how come we haven't found one of these? Because we know that these later forms are found in the Great Lakes. They're found on the north shore of Lake Superior, the Cummins site. They're found in other places. Uh, and this caused us to go back and look at this same diagram that Lewis created. 
And he broke down the Lake Stanley phase into three distinct different lake levels. And when you look at where these would have been and what the environment would have looked like, you suddenly discover, uh, now let me go forward and come back, you suddenly discover that you're talking about three very, very different environments. The early part of Lake Stanley, all of this stuff is dry land. The Alpena Amberley Ridge is not all that important during early Lake Stanley. It certainly doesn't provide any predictability for where the animals should move. Middle Lake Stanley, you've got the Alpena Amberley Ridge. And the reason this is so valuable to hunters is the movement of the animals is predictable. You know where they're going to go. And then in late Lake Stanley, the Alpena Ridge is underwater, and instead you've got a series of islands. Again, a completely different kind of environment that you have to adapt to. And this leads us, this leads us to start thinking about, about these alternatives and where these large bifaces are. Now it turns out some of these large bifaces are really pretty close to us. Um, here are the, the Alpena Amberley Ridge sites. Uh, this is Drop 45, or excuse me, this is the No Prize site, which is a little site up by Hubbard Lake. It was called a no prize site because we were looking for late woodland sites and anyone who found ceramics got a beer that night. <laughs> but finding the Paleo Indian point didn't count, uh, so it's the no prize site. But interestingly, it has a base of a, probably a high-low point. It also has a thumbnail scraper made out of Bayport Chirp, just like we have here. Now that's important both because it matches but it's also important because the Bayport quarry sources weren't available for exploitation until Lake Stanley. They're underwater during Lake Elkhorn. So this is tying us chronologically with what we have here. This is, is a kind of stem Scotts Bluff point that comes from right there at Ossinique in Michigan. It's on a little shelf. It's lower than the Lake Algonquin shoreline. So again, it, it dates to our time period, but probably very early in it. And this is where we started getting what is essentially our new model. And this is the model we're going to be trying to test now. And that looks at each of these stages and what the environment would have looked like and what people should have been doing. Uh, and the middle Lake Stanley is what we have basically concentrated all our effort on. It's the Alpena Amberley Ridge. But there are portions that are deeper water that may well have these bifaces. There are areas that are shallower that may well have this completely different adaptation, basically to fishing and fowling because there aren't any migra migratory prairie anymore. And you remember I showed you those net sinkers? Uh, isn't that coincidental? They're at this elevation. So we suspect that we may actually have bifaces, but they're going to be in very deep water or they're going to be buried. Now, the burying thing is kind of, so, okay, here's kind of the research, but the burying thing is kind of an interesting problem. Because if you look at sites that date to the early Holocene on the mainland, near shore, they're almost always deeply buried. And they're disturbed, because shorelines are very energetic environments, you get a lot of deposition, they're very hard to find. The sites on the Alpena and Everly Ridge, most of them don't have any sediment cover at all. You saw the photographs. They're just sitting there. We don't have to dig them. They're, they're there. Um, in some areas, there is sand. But that sand came from the Alpena and Amberley Ridge. It didn't come from the mainland. We're 60 miles offshore. There's no source to that sediment other than the land itself. So if we have sediment out on the ridge, it dates to an earlier stage of the Alpena and Amberley Ridge. And that's where those light faces are likely to be, that and in the deeper water. So the question comes, how do we find these more deeply, how do we find sites that are buried on the ridge? And particularly, how do we find them if they don't have hunting structures associated with them? You do it with this. This is called a sub-bottom, there are actually two here, this is the big one that weighs a ton, the littler one. These are sub-bottom profilers. And they work on acoustic principles, but instead of sending the sound sideways, they send the concentrated pulse straight down. And they record the echo back. And by doing that, you can see different densities of material underneath. Uh, and this is us. Uh, they're deployed directly underneath the boat. 
Uh, this is us working this summer. You'll notice one of us is an experienced rock climber who knows how to belay people, and one of us doesn't. <laughs> but this is what the sub-bottom profiler can give you. This is a section over by that peak deposit that I told you before. And if you see this, this is the actual scour of channel that that peat was deposited in. And these layers of dark and light are stratified layers of peat and sand. And each of these peat deposits can be dated, can have the ancient DNA extracted from. In this particular area, the deposit's about three meters deep. We found one area where it's five meters deep. And remember, the top is 9,500. Uh, the other thing, which you can barely see here, you'll have to believe me, are these distortion patterns above the lake bottom that are called haystack features. And these are what are really, really interesting. Because it turns out that chipped stone, like flint or chert, resonates at certain acoustic frequencies. So if there is a scatter of chert on the bottom, and we hit it with the sub-bottom profiler, like we did here, it produces this very diagnostic distortion pattern that appears to be up in the water column. So this is actually a way of discovering lithic scatters in cases where there isn't a hunting structure available, where it's buried under shallow amounts of sand. And what's interesting is you don't get this pattern from naturally broken rock. You only get it from those particular kind of weird shaped flakes that you get when you make stone tools. So this is potentially revolutionary. And this gives us a way of finding sites in areas that we haven't looked at before and doing it remotely. And then you put a diver on it, you sample it, you see what material is there. So this, this is stuff we literally just did, did this summer. Uh, and here's, here's a, for example, this is a track. Uh, you're looking at red is high, green is low, the bottom bathymetry. And you can kind of see the track that we did, places where we got contacts. Uh, that suggested either stratification or resonance. And now we can go back to these locations and ground truth them and see, okay, what's there? What are they telling us about? This is how we get at that early phase. And then the late phase is what's at the very top. That's easy. The big problem there is simply how much algae is up there, finding the rocks through the algae. Um, so that's basically, uh, that's, that's about a current as about four weeks ago. Um, so that's what we're up to. Uh, encourage someone in Canada to look at your half of the <laughs> angle of the Alpina Ridge. And, uh, and, and we'll keep working. We'll hope to update you in, uh, in a couple more years. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions if you have any. Yes. That uh, part where you mentioned up here the visibility was, you can almost see water ripples. How shallow is that? That, that slide is 80 feet. 80 feet. We, we regularly work and film at 130 feet with natural light. Thank the zebra message. Yes, Do you have any of that white shirt from uh, Bruce Peninsula? I forget what they call that. There's a, there's a stuff that we call northern gray, oh, okay. which, which, is part of, which is part of that formation. It goes in a big arc from over here. It goes up to Mackinac City. It's on Manitoulin Island. Some of it out perhaps over by Alpena. And yes, a lot, of, a lot of the stuff we found has been there. And what's interesting, those slide, that slide I showed you that had all the chert looked like that pretty honey colored, honey color, if you crack those open, they're all gray. And it turns out that honey color is a result of, of acidic environment, post-deposition, that changes it. Bill Fox, who's, uh, who's a pretty prominent archeologist over in Ontario, saved me from mispublishing that. Uh, he challenged me. I said, we've got this new chirp type. He said, you better break one open. <laughs> but yeah, no, we, that gray stuff is, we find it, we find it too. This one. Actually, two questions. The first is, the peat in your first slide, you said you saw a cut of peat. Was it cut, man, worked, do you think? Or was it just naturally occurring all along? So the, the peat that we found had been cut by water. water. So there was, I, I think if you want to put its history together, there was like a pond that then had a lot of sediment in it that gradually dried out. And then at a later point, a pretty rapid rush of water cut through it. And that exposure is what we initially saw on the sonar, which is why we thought it was a rock cut or something. And then when we investigated it, we saw this thing. And then my second question is, is there any um, indigenous oral tradition or stories that you can 
line up to the caribou and the... The, the, the like question the is, are there indigenous line. accounts yeah. of, of this stuff? Um, there were no indigenous accounts until we published findings. Yeah. Um, which isn't to say, I mean, I mean, we have really good ethnographic information about this from other, other parts of the world, but, you know, this is 10,000 years ago. And it's, um, you know, there's caribou hunters in, in Ontario, in mm -hmm. northern Ontario, and that's where the Falls River stuff is that Andrew Stewart works on. But I don't think anybody, anybody had any idea there was this stuff under, underwater, although some people now claim that they do. Thank you. Yeah. The, the hunters had to move those boulders to make the blinds, but they must be very heavy, the boulders. How, how heavy were they? Well, the question is, how did the hunters move the boulders? Yeah, they're, you know, a boulder that's a, a, a meter in diameter is a pretty heavy, pretty hefty thing. Uh, you move it with levers. Um, and there, there are a lot of examples of this. In, in Southeast Asia, there are actually groups that, that when they have a kind of beer fest together, they get together and construct things. Um, people always underestimate what you can do with simple technology. But yeah, I think the other thing that's important about these is that people didn't, you know, go 100 miles away and get the stones and bring them. They made, took use of what was exactly there. And if there was a natural feature, like a cliff or an escarpment, they used that. Uh, at Drop 45, as much as anything, they moved rocks out of the way to create an open path. But yeah, I think I think with levers you can you can move a lot of those a lot of those rocks. Yes sir. If you had that much peat moss, your suggestion that was heavy thin vegetation ten thousand years ago. There was low in, in that immediate environment there was vegetation. What we find there is, is mainly things that look like pine needles and twigs and seeds. And, and remnants of sedge. And you know, so if you imagine a kind of swamp edge or a marsh edge kind of environment, the kind of plant life you would get there, and then you let that collect for two or three hundred years, that, that's what you're getting. I, I don't think, I think, particularly during the middle period that we've worked on most extensively, uh, it looks like what we have are basically isolated clusters of spruce. We have some tamarack, a little bit of cedar. Um, and you don't get, whereas at the same time on the mainland here, you, you actually have pine, and you have pine being replaced by hardwood. And it's just because it's so cold out there with that glacial meltwater that you, that you kind of escape it. It's also been argued that, that there's actually the influence of the air masses changing. Uh, lake Agassi, which is the big glacial lake of farther north, uh, actually had a burst. And around 9,200 years ago, this massive burst of very, very cold water came down from Lake Agassi. So there's this constant influx of very cold water that I think is retarding the rate at which vegetation and trees are successfully moving back through. Way in the back. Sir, are you aware of the underwater archaeology and underwater geomarchology project that took place off Tola Mori about 30 years ago? I am. Okay. We need to talk. I was there. Oh, good for you. <laughs> Good for you. No, you've got rooted trees there as well. And, and rooted trees are really important because they're, they give you a precise date of that landform. Uh, so yeah, the, the Tobamori stuff had that. We have rooted trees. There's some rooted trees down uh, near uh, San Lab. The most interesting thing was I found one of your TV rigs down there, 90 feet of water. I know one of three times. No kidding. No kidding. <laughs> I hope you got pictures. That'd be great. We tried to. We got weathered out. Uh, on one, uh, uh, one attempt, and the other is the second attempt, uh, one of the divers had a regulator go free flow with the man, and that was it. So, so we got one very brief glimpse of it in the video case. That, that, that's really cool. We have, we have kind of a similar problem like that. We found a, we found a fire ring that we actually mapped and then we took charcoal out of the center of and dated and now we can't find it again. Um, we, we, were using, we, used mar we used these markers on the bottom. There are a couple of these heavy fish weights with, with kind of caution tape and a float on the top. And we didn't realize that having a long strand of caution tape uh, gradually filled with algae and then rolled up and then migrated across the, the sea floor. So we use shorter, shorter things and heavier weights now. But no, it's a real problem. It's a, it's a real problem. And, and
and cold water and regulator free flows is also something we've had experience with. Yes, ma'am. The question is, what are we expecting to find in that DNA? Well, first of all, we're, we're, we're hoping to find everything. Uh, we're working with, uh, with the lab at Copenhagen, which has done the same kind of work on 100,000-year-old deposits in Greenland. And they use what's called a shotgun approach, where they basically amplify all the DNA that's in the sample, and then they match it against a lot massive libraries. So potentially, you can, you can find anything that's there. Um, what we're expecting to see is, is hopefully caribou, uh, and, but there may be muskox, there might be bison, there, 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 could be, there, there could be anything, and it's really because we just don't have any, anything, I mean that, that circuit tooth I showed you is one of the few pieces of fauna in this time period. Do you think you'll find mammoths if you find uh, I'm hoping not, <laughs> but, but, but we, mammoth is in the library. So if there is mammoth DNA there, it'll turn, we'll be able to identify it. Why do people like elephants so much? Right? <laughs> Careful or me. Yeah. Any other questions? Sure. So the obsidian was found, like, by looking at the map, it looks like it was acquired in the States and then brought and sharpened up this way, like for the bridge. Is there anything else to suggest that humans kind of migrated back and forth in that area? Okay, two, two points. So the, the artifacts that we found were from resharpening a tool. So the tool was made of obsidian that came from Oregon. Yeah. We've never found the tool. We've just found the resharpening place. So the question is, how does it get from here to there? Did people really walk to Oregon and then walk back? And I'm pretty sure they didn't. But what links where we are in Lake Huron and that site in Oregon, and actually some of the sites up in Alaska, is it's the ice edge. It's the area that is recently deglaciated. And I think that was a unique ecotone that was exploited. And unlike this kind of north-south move north with warmer weather, I think it was probably people working along that edge. And that edge gradually moved north. So I'm imagining you probably had some kind of hand-to-hand -hand exchange down the line, but in that recently deglaciated environment. And I think that's the way you actually got obsidian back and forth and probably other stuff. Okay. So would, would people have come together? I'm assuming other communities would join together to build these big blinds and the drives and stuff like that. It wouldn't just be one localized community? Well, would you? Th that's, an inter that's an interesting question. The question is, did, did a bunch of people come together to build these drives or did just a single family? Now, the thing that Andrew Stewart found was that these structures tend to grow by by uh, accumulation. So you build a bit, and if it's in a good spot, you add a bit on, and then Uncle Joe decides he wants his blind near your blind, and so he'll give us a blind there. And, leave your and they the kind patch. of accrete, because they don't, the rocks don't go away, right? They all stay kind of put. So one model is, is that they're kind of growing by accretion. Now some of these more complex ones only work if all the pieces are there. And so that one you might expect a larger number of people. One of, the, one of the models we've argued is that there's a very different kind of hunting in the fall and in the spring. And in the fall, we think it's probably smaller groups of people hunting, but they're hunting for winter meat. And we often find caching sites in the locations near where these fall-oriented sites are. In the spring, people are coming out of winter quarters, everybody's hungry. You, that's where you tend to have these larger hunting structures. And there's no evidence of meat storage around these larger structures. So my guess is people, probably larger groups of people are coming together, and then they're hanging out for a while because the meat isn't going to store anyway. We might as well hang out. Let's exchange information. Let's let's swap DNA. Let's do whatever we're going to do. <laughs> uh, which, which for hunter gatherers you don't get to do very well. So when the opportunity presents itself in terms of a very seasonally dense resource, this is when hunter gatherers do tend to aggregate. And so I, there may be a difference between the fall and the spring. Yes, ma'am. How did you start this? Like, did you look at the the maps of the receding glacier and go, I wonder if there's something to this? Or did you go swimming and find a rock and go, hey, is there something to this? How does... Not many people drove 60 miles offshore to go swimming. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
No, to, to, be, to be absolutely honest, two things happened in very close sequence. One is Noah published the map that was the first time the term Alpina Amberley Ridge had ever been written on a bathymetry map. And it showed it as a continuous structure rather than a discontinuous structure. And at, the, at this time, I was reading a book about caribou her or about reindeer herding in Siberia. And in that book, they were talking about how do these very small groups of families manage a herd of a thousand semi-domesticated reindeer. And it turns out when they wanted the reindeer to move from one pasture to another, they, they went out like George Bush and cut brush, laid it on the ground, and this was enough to deflect the movement, the movement of the animals. And it was kind of seeing these two things together and saying, you know, and I'd been working on shipwrecks. So we knew about sight scan and we knew about acoustics. And it was like, you know, out there there's going to be rock. Maybe they were doing this. And we got a high risk grant from NSF, and that's how we did the first discovery. Mm -hmm. Science is serendipity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Size of the ridge? The size of the ridge. It varies between about five and, and maybe eight miles wide. And it goes as the crow flies from Presqu'ile in Michigan to here. The important thing is it's only about five to eight miles wide. And that's what limits the ability of, that's what makes the caribou movement so predictable which is why it's worth your time to invest in permanent hunting structures. It's also why there may not be permanent hunting structures in that earliest phase, because it's a much wider open, open field of movement for animals. Okay, so how come we haven't jumped on board over here to meet you in the middle? Well, Andrew Stewart has actually volunteered to meet me in the middle, but he doesn't do underwater archaeology. Um, there's no, there's no reason. It's just, I mean, the, the one thing that's different in Canadian law as opposed to in the, in the United States is the initial survey that we did with site scan. You have to have a permit in Canada. You don't in, North, in the United States. So we were able to do that initial work without having to go through the permitting process. We now go through the permitting process, which is no big deal. But it just, it's just somebody needs to do it, and we'd be happy to collaborate if somebody wants to, wants our, to do it. Our why can't you just come on over? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, sir. My great uncle had done a fair amount of archaeology up, up and down the coast, uh, in Bridger and Nodwell sites up in the Moorage. And a lot of the material that he was coming out of is all woodland sites. My question is, is that when First year about your your studies about a dozen years ago or so, we were at a point where the lake level was really, really low. And I kind of started wondering about the rim. How many possible sites, whether it be woodland or more earlier, are maybe along the edges, uh, you know, maybe within 60 feet of water, 50 feet of water. But so the question is, could there be sites that are closer to shore and in shallower water, essentially, of all sorts of periods? Yeah. And the answer is absolutely. But the, the problem is, the closer you get to the shore, the higher energy environment you're in. So the likelihood of, first of all, finding an intact site goes way down. And the sites that are there that are old are going to have a big sediment burden on top of them. So some of the middle archaic sites that, that terrestrial archaeologists have dug in coastal areas or riverine areas typically have three or four meters of mud on top of them. So how do you how do you even find that site? But you're absolutely right. I mean, in, in fact, this is one of the problems because if you're thinking about a seasonal model, one of our problems is where do these guys go in the winter? Because nobody's going to be out there in the winter, and they clearly go to the tree line on the mainland, and. But that's still underwater, but it's in that zone where it's going to be very hard to, to find the sites. And so that's a, that's a, that's a, it's a real problem. But they're clearly there. They were there. Well, thank you, John. I think we, uh, we all appreciate uh, the uh,
presentation uh, tonight, and we appreciate you coming up here to give it to us. And we thank you, because uh, we didn't dream we'd have <laughs> this many people. And so, so the interest is there, and we, and we appreciate that.